Hello, everyone. Dr. Stillman and Amy Arp here today to Hello. talk about another book, Quiet Leadership, another of my favorite, favorite books. Amy, how are you today? Wonderful. I thought the book was great. I read it. Here it is. <laughs> Excellent. Good work. Let's dive in. So the reason I picked this book is that I never was interested, in, particularly in leadership as a child, let alone a medical student, let alone as a doctor. But I had this experience as a physician of taking care of people and realizing that the number one problem we faced in medical care, healthcare, the doctor patient relationship was a lack of really effective leadership. And I'm very careful to say effective leadership, right? Mm -hmm. Because the reality is there's a lot of leading going on. Go to this doctor, see this doctor, do this test, get this mm -hmm. prescription, a lot of leading but there isn't good leadership. There's not effective leadership. And what doctors will often complain about is, well, patients don't take care of themselves. They don't exercise. They don't eat right. They don't do this. They don't do that. And that's really a grotesque failure of leadership within the healthcare industry where doctors are not Absolutely. leading by example. They're not leading mm -hmm. effectively to get people to take action, to be healthy and well. Mm -hmm. And the more I've meditated on and thought on this topic, the more I've thought, well, everyone's a leader. I mean, maybe all you're leading around is a Yorkie poo or, a, <laughs> you know, another, another very small animal. Maybe you lead around a, you know, herd of cats. Maybe sometimes you think the cats are hurting you. <laughs> Whoever you're leading, you're a parent, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're a this, mm -hmm. you're a that, you're a CEO, you're leading somebody mm -hmm. and there's no shortage of followers in the world. Absolutely. There's a real shortage yeah. of effective leadership. And I see so many people coming to me complaining about their lives and their lack of good outcomes in their health, mm -hmm. their wellness, and just their lives, you know, because what I see happening a lot is that people don't achieve their health goals because they're not effectively being led in other areas of their lives, or they're not effectively leading. They're not succeeding at work. Their business is not flourishing. They're uh, an employee and they have terrible leadership above them, which this book could help you with, believe it or mm -hmm. not. But this lack or gap in leadership is really a big part of the problem that I see in people's health and wellness. And so perhaps surprisingly, I'm a medical doctor talking about leadership. Mm -hmm. So Amy, any thoughts on all that before I dive into the book? I think that's excellent. And that is so true in every on every level. And I think this is why I really do. Like as you, you talk about it more, we'll explain some of the concepts. But I think a lot of the concepts that Dr. Solman is going to talk about are why people are kind of just staying stagnant in life. They're not moving forward. They're not achieving, you know, goals, things that they want to. They just yeah. kind of stay the same because we just continue doing the same thing. We haven't changed anything. So I 100% agree with what you said. And on the note of goals, if you missed our podcast on four disciplines of execution, which I'm pointing to down on my coffee table over there, that was our last episode. It was really good. It talked about goals and goal setting and mm -hmm. how to achieve goals. And I actually put together a little mini course on that, which is over at Stillman Wellness, stillmanwellness.com. You'll get access to, it's really a 45 minute course. It's really short, really sweet, but it's really impactful in terms of how to think about goal setting. So as you think about leadership, it will be really helpful to you to have that material, have that information so that you know, you're leading towards something instead of just in sort of a general vague direction, which is another big problem with leaders. You know, they say, well, we want to improve our numbers. Well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. We want to have a culture of transparency and integrity. Well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <Great question. laughs> so a lot of that. Yeah. One other thought I had before you dive in, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that over the years that I've um, really held on to is that we have to learn to lead ourselves before we can ever lead others. And so if we're not leading our own lives and taking charge and doing the things to lead ourselves well, how are we ever going to effectively lead anyone else? And we're Great. going to talk Another about book. that yeah. <laughs> next month in September. We're reading Mach 2 with Your Hair on Fire by Richard Bliss Brook, who's my mentor. And it's about it, the subtitle is How to Master Self-Motivation and Stay on Fire for Life. And this book this one is awesome. I love this book. I'm reading it again right now for the third time. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. yeah but great. I think it, it applies today when we're talking about leadership. Like we're going to talk a lot about yeah. both leading ourselves and leading others. 
So I want to open with a quote from the book. This is on page 35, and it's it's actually a quote from, from Galileo who said, one cannot teach a man anything. One can only enable him to learn from within himself. I cannot tell you how often I observe people in the world. They, their, their tactic for changing other people and leading other people is to verbally assault them. <laughs> And it looks <laughs> just like someone, you know, running up to, I, and I can't help but picture the the knights in Monty Python who run up to the castle at one point, Monty Python and the Quest <laughs> of the Holy Grail, the knights run up to the castle and they're hitting the castle walls with their swords. And of course it's a parody and it's funny. Uh -huh. and it's hilarious. But that is literally how people go about trying to lead other people to change. Yes, that's so true. <laughs> their lives. I see it every day. Somebody will say, well, I don't, I, I'm having, I'm trying to lose weight. And someone will say, oh, well, you've got to try this. And they'll say, well, I don't know about that. And, and then they do this dance back and forth. It gets very awkward, very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, the person who's trying to help them, trying to lead them to a better place will come away saying, well, that person was stupid. That person didn't get it. That person mm -hmm. doesn't understand. That person has a bad mindset. That person has a bad attitude. That person is just grossly misinformed. They'll say things like, isn't it sad that people are this way or people are this resistant to change or whatever. Mm -hmm. When in reality, what ended up happening was you just related to them in a way that they found, quite frankly, not very winning or convincing. And that's mm -hmm. not on them. That's actually in large part on you. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a big thing we stress with people that we take care of and who we, and who we coach having that mindset of they're the problem is called uh, having an external locus of control. And if you move your locus of control within yourself, you say, I'm in charge, I'm capable, I can do this, I can make this happen. You have a completely different mindset about the interaction. And this is critically important to leading people because what I found the hard way is that no matter how much, because people were coming to me as a doctor and saying, well, we trust you and we believe in you and we're sure you're really smart and that you're going to tell us what we ought to do and it'll work. You know, and, and I was having people coming to me and paying me for my time. And, and mm -hmm. yet I would tell them to do things because that's what I knew how to do. Doctors get trained how to tell other people what to do to get where they want to be, which is not coaching, by the way. <laughs> uh, big distinction there. And they would come back to me and either it wouldn't work. And I would either would not work because I hadn't picked the right things, but then I started to realize that often it wasn't that I'd picked the wrong things. It was that they hadn't actually done any of the things. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to lead yes. them to this place and I realized, okay, hang on a minute. This is not just about me knowing all of the things about light and sound and EMF and food and supplements and testing and functional medicine. This mm -hmm. is about understanding how do people choose day to day what to do and how to make decisions and how to be on a day to day basis. And that was really more about, well, how do I get them to actually learn within themselves what's really going on and what the dialogue is underneath the surface? And then I started to realize that the most important thing I did in any interview was to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I realized that as I started to ask more and more questions of people, I started to realize you know, because understanding where they are in terms of their labs and their numbers and their weight and their height and their HRV, that's really easy. But you have no idea where someone is internally in terms of where they see themselves in the world, how they feel about themselves, what they believe, what they think. You have no idea from all that data. And that's why so many people, they, they are not being led or they're not allowing themselves to be led or leaders are not effectively leading is they don't have this understanding of where people really are because when you know where they are by asking questions, only then can you get them to go through this process of learning within themselves. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Brock writes in, in the book early on that basically he, he discovered three things about leading people that I, I absolutely agree with. He said to take any kind of committed action, people need to think things through for themselves. Number two, people experience a degree of inertia around thinking for themselves due to the energy required. And number three, the act of having an aha moment gives off the kind of energy needed for people to become motivated and willing to take action. So where I see number one showing up is that when I just handed people the, 
go take three 10 minute walks, drink some spring water, eat a protein at every meal, get the lights out at night and go to sleep and have positive social connection. That was really easy. I said all that in probably less than 10 seconds, but how many people went through and actually did it? Not a lot. Mm -hmm. And what I realized we had to do is when people had buy-in by going through the process of understanding why they needed to do that, then they would actually go do it. Then on top of that, they would have an inertia around, well, I don't understand why I need to do this. And that's where getting into relationship with them and understanding where they were, where they wanted to be, their goal, where they were, and why they didn't understand doing X, Y, and Z would get them there fastest, most reliably, and with the best uh, success. You have to do that. You have to help them get through that inertia of, well, I don't understand why this applies to me or why I should care about taking walks or eating protein or drinking spring water mm -hmm. or getting the lights out at night. And so you have to explain it to them. Well, you told me you were worried about your grandmother. She got dementia. You don't want to get dementia because of how horrible it was for her. You told me about how you want to lose weight. You want to get rid of your brain fog. You want to do this. I have to explain how all of these things that I tell everyone to do are applying to them in a unique context. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even telling them I'm checking in with them over and over and over again. Does that make sense? You know, do you see why I recommend that? So Absolutely. they're coming to this conclusion themselves based on small pieces of information that I'm sharing with them and making sure that they are still with me because where I see people failing over and over again to lead other people to health is that the people are not with them on the journey they're trying to take them on, whether it's three mm -hmm. 10 minute walks or a 20 minute CrossFit workout or a 90 day diet or a 14 day reset, they don't understand, or they haven't come through the process themselves, this inertia of reasoning for themselves to get to the destination. Absolutely. And then the last piece of this is the aha moment. Cause I would see this in people's faces when I would connect the dots and I'm actually thinking of a specific patient. So I'll tell the story. This woman came to me who had um, horrible uh, skin issues due to an aluminum-based sunscreen. And I, we had this long conversation, mm -hmm. well, where do you live and what do you, what's going on and what, what's the problem, the skin issue? And then we got into talking about, okay, well, what do, you, what do you put on your skin? What's this? What's that? How much sun do you get? Sunglasses, all these things that I talk about ad nauseum in our social media, but that she hadn't been exposed to because you can't get through all, all of our social media at once. It, there's too much of it. And I say, oh my gosh, well, aluminum in the skin, autoimmune diseases, all these problems, blah, blah, blah. And she has this aha moment of, oh my gosh, really? I had no idea there was this link. So she ditches the sunscreen, starts going out in the sun, takes off her sunglasses. And two, three, four months later, all of her problems with her skin have completely cleared up. Wow. And, and this, is, this was what was necessary though, because if I had just told mm -hmm. her, sunscreen's bad for you, don't use it, that isn't enough. Yes. And I got her there by asking questions about the situation, understanding what was going on, and then explaining to her the reasoning so she could go through this process of understanding and learning to get to the logical conclusion of, you don't need this sunscreen <clears throat> and you need to get rid of it because it may be ruining your skin. Mm -hmm. It's Amy. so much more powerful yeah. when you come up with like me, if I come up with the idea on my own, rather than if you tell me. Because if Dr. Stillman tells me something, I might be like, okay, that's great. <laughs> nice. But he's never experienced that. And then when I come up with it on my own, then I have a conviction about it and say, oh yeah, okay. That was my idea or, you know, assisted with Dr. Stillman, but it's helpful and powerful when we come up with our own ideas. It's empowering. And I think that's the yeah. biggest piece of what we do in coaching people at Stillman Wellness and taking care mm -hmm. of patients at Stillman MD is that it is not this model of you are the broken car. I put you up on the lift and we rearrange things and fix things mm -hmm. or supplements and hormones and whatever into your body. And you know, you're not just a car. I use a lot of car analogies, which is deeply ironic because I know almost nothing about them. <laughs> yeah. That's why often I start making an analogy with a car and it starts to fall apart. Cause and I you can stop. You're like, man, nothing. okay. <laughs> But the reality is we have to empower people to do this thinking for themselves yeah. because that's mm -hmm. the real key to being healthy and well sustainably without constantly having to ask myself or members of the team 
questions because there's more questions than we could possibly answer from the number of people who want to work mm -hmm. with us. And I think we see sometimes people fail because they they just want someone to tell them what to do. And I think mm -hmm. that's a normal human response. We all want to just take the easier path. We want to know what do we do? You know, you're the expert. Tell me what to do. But I think what happens is that if someone says something that maybe we don't fully agree with or don't understand, then we're going to go to the next person who's going to tell us what to do because there's plenty of people out there that'll tell you mm -hmm. what to do. Yeah. <laughs> and then they'll try that thing and it doesn't work. And so then they go to the next person. And then, and so I think what Dr. Stillman is saying is if we get to the place of just ourselves discovering some of those things and some of the answers, then we'll have greater success in our health and our life and everything. Well, on top of that, I, I find that people don't vet their leaders well. Yes, that's another and problem. His, history's got a very strong case, um, <laughs> yes. infinite number of cases for this. Absolutely. <laughs> people don't pick good leaders. And, and people come to me and they've been to all these other clinics and all these other practices uh -huh. and tried all these other protocols. Those people didn't lead them to success. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's sometimes it's the the practices problem. They don't have a good paradigm. That paradigm wasn't Absolutely. good for that patient. Mm -hmm. That's actually why we have a very strict selection process for the practice where if we don't think you're a good fit, nothing personal. If we don't think we're the best practice to serve you with your needs, your problems, your, mm -hmm. you know, unique life context, we're going to refer you to somebody who we do think is the right fit mm -hmm. uh, because that's, appropriate. And a lot mm -hmm. of practices don't bother to do that, which is why I get a lot of unhappy patients from other practices. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so uh, then Rock has this great rubric for taking people through the process of, of really discovering these things within themselves or learning from within themselves. And the whole idea is, is essentially not telling people what to do, but helping them think at a higher level. And this is something that really it's so important because our, our world is getting more complex all the time. And so if you don't learn how to think for yourself, think critically, it's said, I mean, people talk about thinking critically all the time, but I don't think that they actually know how to do it or teach it. And I like rocks approach to this because it makes sense to me. It's what I've seen work and it's what I would encourage other people to look into and adopt. Mm -hmm. And he has this process for helping people improve their thinking. And he points out, by the way, in this book, it's mostly meant for managers of businesses and things like that. But, but he points out that, you know, employees are miserable because there's a very much a top down hierarchy in modern corporate, the modern corporate world. And people who mm -hmm. tend to be happiest at work have autonomy and they're being led by people who are actually very quiet and do very little talking. And that is part of the title for the book. That's why I noticed that the more I didn't talk during my interviews with patients, the better the results I actually got because I was getting to the, them to do all the talking and all the relating. And they, I, they were able to tell me exactly what was going on. And then I would connect some dots for them. And then, then they would take sort of those dots and they would find the lesson in them. And then they would actually take that and go out and, and make changes. Mm -hmm. So uh, his, his process starts with let them do all the thinking. So if your approach to changing someone's mind, helping someone, convincing someone starts with you talking at them, you are getting dismal, miserable results. You're not actually having any significant impact on the world that might sting, hurt, smart, insult you, upset you. But I can't tell you how frequently in my own life, people are talking at me and they have no idea that they're just annoying me. They're irritating me. <laughs> I'm like, when is this person going to ask me a question about why I'm not buying what they're selling or why I'm mm -hmm. not interested in what they're saying? Mm -hmm. And the reason why people, I mean, there's lots of reasons why people approach uh, leadership the way that they do. But the first step in really getting better results is let the person you're talking to do all the thinking. Mm -hmm. They're going to be deeply honored by it. They're going to really enjoy it. And it's the only way to get them to improve their thinking in the first place. Otherwise, you just turn into somebody who's got an endless number of people who want to ask you an endless number of questions. Uh, and that's exhausting. But if that's your thing, I guess, you know, knock yourself out. <laughs> and then I know it's, I'm joking, but yeah. I know. <laughs> the second piece is focus on solutions. And this was, he's got a really interesting graphic in here where he, it's, it's sort of like a, a, a compass, you know, with four, four directions. And, 
there's the problem over here, there's the solution over here, and there's philosophy and details. And the philosophy and the details will actually distract you from the solution. Mm -hmm. And I've, I don't know why I've always been really solutions focused and I'm, I'm able and I, I have an appetite for details. I have an appetite for philosophy, but at the end of the day, I care about getting results. And a lot of people live in those three quadrants of problems, philosophy, and details. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go to say a theology, uh, department at a, at a, uh, you know, a religious university and say, Hey, you know, I'm looking cause theology professors are like the philosophers of of, uh, of the religious world and say, how many people have you converted in the last 365 days? There's a good chance they'd say zero. Mm -hmm. They're stuck in the philosophy quadrant. Mm -hmm. And if you went to somebody at a church who worked in say, I don't know, administration, you said, how many people have you converted in the last 365 days? They might say zero because they're stuck in the details. Mm -hmm. Oh, we ran out of toilet paper. Oh, the youth pastor is moving away. Oh, the you know second vocalist is sick. What do we do? They are in, stuck in all this detail. It's not that it's yeah. not important. It's not that it's not relevant. It's not that somebody doesn't have to do it, but people get stuck there. Yes. And we see this all the time in medicine where people are like talking about the philosophy of like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, like what does it mean to be healthy and well? And then we get other people who are like, well, you've got to have a, this number of that. And you, if your <laughs> HRV is under 50, you're a disaster. And if you don't uh -huh. live on the equator or you don't get this much sun or you're, this is that you're That's just true. whatever. And you're never going to be alive and feel it's whatever. Yeah. So they get stuck in the details and then there's the people who want to live in the problems and they just, it's, and this blows my mind, but people will just spend all of their time like just rabbit holing about things like Lyme disease and EMF. And you have to understand these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when it's like every day, all I read about is papers on this problem. It just doesn't end well. It ends mm -hmm. in, I'm constantly afraid. I'm constantly telling other people to be afraid. I'm I, I and I, and these people never get results. I mean, they never get results. They will pretend they get results. They will talk about getting results, but then you see their patients, their followers, the people who bought into their shtick, and it's a disaster. There's no mm -hmm. real understanding of solutions because these people were not solutions focused. Mm -hmm. And being solutions focused is you have to understand the problem in enough detail to articulate it, to talk about it. If you don't understand the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes or Lyme disease or chronic fatigue syndrome or whatever, then you may not ever make any progress with those people. But yeah. the funny thing is, is you talk to a guy like Jim, who's, you know, Jim Laird, our strength and conditioning coach at Stillman Wellness and Stillman MD. Jim doesn't know a lot of the pathophysiology behind a lot of diseases, but he doesn't need to, because what will happen is people will come in and they will say, I'm sick, broken, dysfunctional, whatever. And Jim will say, well, just start by taking three 10 minute walks and drinking some spring water and eating a protein at every meal and getting the lights out at night and having positive social connection. And sure enough, if they do those things, they will come back and say, wow, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. I can't believe mm -hmm. how well that worked. Yes. What else have you got for me? Mm -hmm. And the lesson there is that you don't have to know everything about the problem to come up with an adequate solution. And so being solutions focused in your conversations is actually something that requires conscious effort. And the people out there who don't get results in life are stuck in one of the other three quadrants of that, so to speak. Um, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it. Those other three quadrants, philosophy, yeah. details, and um, and problems. Amy? Yeah. And I would say we can't, like, I, I think that um, one way to take this is like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know, Dr. Sullivan is saying all these harsh things. But I think that um, what we can say, think through also is we're human, you know, we do realize, we do, I think the first thing is realizing that, you know, we've all heard the phrase like misery loves company. I think in some ways that's like the problem section in my mind where I'm like, we like to sometimes just focus on the problems, like stew on the problems. And so yeah. I think first recognizing like we're human, we're not going to fully get this right every single time. But if we can start shifting towards that solution mindset, then more often than not, we'll get it right some of the time and then we'll get it right more times and we'll get it right even more times. And so right. I think even with this 
if you're thinking through like, oh, wow, maybe that's me, or I haven't really been solutions focused. I've never even thought about that. Um, take one step. You know, I think we talked about that last time of like taking one step towards this and not thinking about how do I overhaul my entire thinking in one sitting, but how do I just take some small steps towards this? Um, and so I just wanted to add that in there. Yeah, absolutely. The third uh, step he outlines is remembering to stretch. And this part is really important because the reality is you're getting what you're getting because of what you've been doing. You don't mm -hmm. have, we will often say to people, you don't have a thyroid problem or a shoulder problem. You have a thyroid or a shoulder result. So being solutions focused is asking, well, what things have we been doing to create the result rather than looking at it as a problem? Cause that's the solution. And what tends to happen is if people are really going to change their reality, they have to stretch who they are and how they think about the world because how they think about the world and who they are is what's created the problem in the first place. Mm -hmm. Very common example of this would be something like hypothyroidism. Most of the people I see with hypothyroidism are hard charging go getters. And when their thyroid starts to lag, they instinctively rebel against this deterioration because they say, I don't have time to be slow. I don't have time to gain weight. I don't have time to, to deal with the fact that my thyroid is not working the way it did when I was 20, 25, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, without getting too deep into the weeds on the details of why the thyroid goes off or what we do in that specific situation to fix people, it's important to understand. And the point of this is that you have to stretch who you are to understand how to actually get to a place where your thyroid's going to work in a sustainable fashion. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is it's going to require you to eat some new foods, incorporate some new habits. One of the biggest things is reducing the amount of stress and therefore responsibility some someone may actually be under or or in or have. Mm -hmm. Because what will often happen with people who've got who wind up with low thyroid hormone function is they've been under so much stress for so long that it's completely depleted their reserves and they may not have been nourishing themselves adequately. And so predictably the thyroid hormone level drops. Mm -hmm. And so you have to stretch yourself personally in order to come to a place where you actually, um, are quite literally a new person. You are a person who doesn't take on too much. You are a person who does nourish themselves. Well, you are a person who does take care of their physical body. And that's actually more than just a series of uh, habits or choices is very much a shift in someone's mindset because usually what we see is there's a lot of resistance to that change. Well, I can't, uh, hire someone to run my business for me because they don't, won't know how mm -hmm. I can't sell my business because no one else knows how to run it and it would just fall apart. I can't, you know, get my kids to behave. I can't mm -hmm. get my spouse to help me. I can't, we see a lot of roadblocks in people's thinking mm -hmm. and that's, because they have ultimately a limited mindset and they have to expand that mindset if they're going to fix these problems and really create fundamentally a new reality. So when you're leading someone there, you have to get them to stretch mm -hmm. and that means getting them to start thinking about, well, how do I have to change who I am if I'm going to get this outcome, which mm -hmm. is a big part of why we don't say to patients, well, you know, you've got to do it this way or you've got to do it that way. We walk them through, well, here are the consequences of doing it this way. What do you think about that? And that's a very different experience than you have hypothyroidism, take this pill, come back in six weeks for another round of lab tests, and then we'll have a follow up visit to discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you said something very key there is that it is, even though a lot of this stuff is going to be us taking charge of changing our mindset, doing the things. One of the things Dr. Stillman is saying is also it's important to have a coach to walk you through this process. And so that is what Dr. Stillman is saying that him and our practice and everyone here on the team um, can help you with because you do need someone to help you through the process. Even though we may not tell you exactly what to do, we may help guide you there. It is still very important to have someone guide you. And so I just want to say that also, because some of this stuff you might be thinking, 
oh, well, I can't possibly do that. Or it sounds like a lot of I have to do this or self this. And yes, there's an element that you need to take responsibility. But also we're here to help you, to coach you through. Even when he was talking about Jim, Jim is a great coach. He asks questions and coaches and guides people. And so this is very, very important in every step of this that Dr. Stillman's talking about. And a big piece of the value we offer people is helping them understand how do they actually need to stretch? Mm -hmm. They may be trying to stretch to do something like, well, I'm going to go carnivore. And that may be a huge mountain for them to climb. It may be massively difficult psychologically or emotionally or practically. It may be really mm -hmm. too expensive for them or whatever, whatever the problem with that is for them. We may say to them, Hey, you don't need to stretch to do that. You need to stretch to do this over here. Mm -hmm. So helping people understand what direction do you need to stretch yourself? Because one thing we run into over and over again is people don't have an infinite amount of bandwidth. They're not like these infinitely expandable, tough rubber bands. You, you, you stretch <laughs> them too much and they will either snap back into place or they will break. And you have to be careful about that. And we respect that and we honor that, which is also part of the, you know, this, this dance that we do with coaching, which is, you know, do you think you can do that? Well, you know, yeah, I do. You know, are you saying that just because you want us want to say yes? Or do you really think you can commit to this and make it happen? Mm -hmm. And all of that is part of the, the, the art, the magic, the fun of actually helping people do this is well, which direction should you stretch in to get to this goal? The next step is accentuate the positive. And he includes this really sobering fact uh, later in the book. People get, on average, a couple of minutes of positive feedback each year versus thousands of hours of negative feedback. And mm -hmm. I, I think it was Rick Warren who said, if you talked to other people the way that you talk to yourself, would you have any friends? <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Uh, you know, I see this over yeah. and over again. I played pickleball yesterday with some people, and the girl I was playing with, she was being really hard on herself and I could see it. Yeah. And I thought she would never say that to me. She would never say something like, you know, Leland, you've got to hit that shot. That would be rude. I would be like, Oh, excuse me. But we say those sorts of things to ourselves. Yes. And a lot of that negative feedback is actually it's, it's our, from ourselves and something mm -hmm. I had a really remarkable experience with Jim when he started to coach me, uh, in the gym physically, physical training. He said, good job. And I thought, whoa. And I actually remember the moment <laughs> thinking, even though I know Jim, and I've known Jim for years, even mm -hmm. though I've done physical things before, I'm kind of amazed by the profound effect that Jim saying good job just had on how my brain feels. Uh -huh. And I've watched Jim coach countless people since then. Yes. And he's very strategic with the good job. That was great. You did great work. Mm -hmm. today. And it's really important for people to understand that the way people are wired, they're set up, the way society is, is this constant, constant stream of negativity. And that's why when you're trying to lead someone somewhere, positively accentuating the positive, being positive with them is actually really, really, really important. Mm -hmm. And so many people I see trying to lead people, trying to convince people, trying to cajole people, sell people, whatever you want to call it. They're leading with just like, this is amazing. This is incredible. This is so good. You need this. This is, and they're just building it up and it's just all this hype and it's all this excitement and it's all great. And it, it but at the end of the day, there's no feedback for, wow, you took that first step of showing up in the gym. Congratulations. That's great. I'm so mm -hmm. glad you showed up for you today. Mm -hmm. And the, the feeling people get that then get, gets them to continue to take action, to continue to build those habits, to continue to do that is actually very, very powerful and is a huge part. I mean, I, I don't know if a lot of you know parents, coaches, teachers, teachers, doctors, whoever is doing the coaching realize if you're not integrating some element of positive feedback, I don't even know if you should show up because not only is it really easy to do. Uh, it costs you nothing, practically speaking. Uh, it has a massive effect. And that's why he includes it as its own bullet point in his process. Mm -hmm. And I the agree. last piece of this is uh, putting the process before the content. And I found this really interesting. 
because to me, put process before content was not obvious in terms of what it meant until it, it started to make sense to me in my own world, which is, you know, we would, we would, in, in my world, content would be things like, well, let's talk about the thyroid. Let's talk about the kidney. Let's talk about the Lyme disease. Let's talk about the heart attack, the heart disease. It's not about the content. It's about the process. What's the process we're trying to engage in? It's becoming healthier. Hmm. And it's also the process of leading someone to the decisions to achieve that good health, which is actually not the same as the, the, the content. So if you're, you know, a parent trying to get your kid to make better choices, the content is not put the fruity pebbles away and get out some salad. It's <laughs> a process of why do you think it's okay to eat that at 11 o'clock at night? Mm -hmm. What yeah. do you think is going to happen? That's the process of helping them gain these insights from within themselves so that they can make better decisions. Absolutely. Uh, anything else on that, Amy, that you want to add? Yeah, I, I think just emphasizing again that this is not something that's innate in people. This is a learned thing, even for it us. Is. And so I think just more reason to, if you're walking through something in your health, um, or, you know, you're trying to, I don't know, even apply it to your business or whatever, having a coach to help guide you is so, so important because it's, you know, to get all of the things that Dr. Stillman is talking about is really critical and crucial. And it's just not something that is innate. And so I don't want anyone to kind of listen to this and think like, oh my gosh, I've never thought about that. Um, it's learned. You can it's learn. Normal. Yeah, right. everyone. And, you know, and I think just thinking about health journeys, something like this might feel very overwhelming at first by thinking, okay, I'm still just caught up in the emotions of being diagnosed let right. alone now I have to like change my thinking and right. change my diet and change everything. And Don't so feel overwhelmed. very overwhelmed. Um, yeah. And so while this step is really good, I think just remembering one step at a time in the process, get a coach, come work with us, you know, we'll help guide you, give you bite-sized pieces that you can take and then you'll get there. You'll eventually get there. It just takes one step at a time. Exactly. And it's all according to this, basic process of helping you understand how to get to where you want to be. Absolutely. There's this next piece in the book that I want to talk about. Um, and there's a lot to this book. I really can't do it justice uh, because a lot of it is actually pretty technical and really it's the kind of book I'll read twice and think about as I go through it. But there's another piece that he, he brings into this, which he calls the dance of insight, which I think is, funny and cute and and is exactly what it is at mm -hmm. the end of the day and he calls this dance of insight placement questioning and clarifying and i did not it didn't make sense to me when i first started to read about it but as i started to get into what he meant by all of this i realized it was exactly where i had arrived in how i take a history from a patient because I found that it was what was necessary in order to help people really get great results. Mm -hmm. And I also started to realize that the reason why a lot of people struggle to help other people change and lead other people to better choices is that they weren't following these basic steps. And the first step is placement. And placement's a really odd word. I don't think if you said, well, what do you think about placement in a conversation? I think the average person would say, what planet are you on and what language are you speaking? <laughs> When he says placement, what he means is you have to you have to set the stage for where you're going with the conversation. So if somebody comes to me and they say, well, I've got all these problems and all these issues and all this and that and the other thing is going on and it's just overwhelming and I've got 400 pages of notes and MRIs and CT scans and lab testing and doctor's notes and hospital visits and just an insane amount of material for Dr. Stillman to look at, right? The first thing I would do is I would say, aside from obviously going through all of that, although I go through it pretty quickly uh, because I don't get lost in the details, is I would say, so where you're at is you've had all this medical care, you've gone through all these things, you've tried all this stuff and nothing's worked or it mm -hmm. hasn't gotten you where you'd like to be. Is that correct? And I would wait for them to acknowledge that because where we're, where I'm placing us by asking a question like that is, where are you coming from? What have you already been through? And what are you hoping to get out of this interaction with me? 
it might seem like that's obviously what people want, but if you don't place yourself and them in the conversation, you'll actually make the mistake of thinking someone's there for something they're not there for. And I see this playing out in people's lives over and over and over again. They start telling someone about a solution to a problem that that person doesn't even think they have. Hmm. And that ends up being a lot of wasted time. People get irritated, mm -hmm. they're frustrated, they're disappointed, the whole nine. So that's placement. You have to place where you are in the conversation and sort of set the stage. And a lot of that is actually about getting permission. Many people don't realize that they're having conversations that they're not even really, uh, the other person doesn't really want to have with them. Mm -hmm. They're nosy, they're officious, they pry. And they are sort of feel good about people sharing with them all these secrets and stories and things. But the truth is they actually didn't really want to necessarily talk about that. And a lot of people will describe, you know, they feel like they hit a stone wall in a conversation. That stone wall isn't the other person uh, repelling you. It's the other person saying, you don't have permission to have access to that information about my life. Mm -hmm. And we get into that in the healthcare space all the time because we do wind up dealing with the most intimate details of people's lives. And we have to get permission to go there or we may not get any information back or potentially worse, we may get false information back. Mm -hmm. Like how are things going with you and your wife? Oh, things are fine. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Glad we talked about that. Not having the wherewithal to say, you know, could we talk for a moment about, you know, some of the intimate issues that may be going on in your case. Mm -hmm. When you get permission from people to talk about what you want to talk about, it always ends better than if you just assume that they're interested in listening to you prattle on for minute after minute about what you think is important that will help them. Mm -hmm. And it'll also inform you of where you are with that person in terms of your relationship. Because the truth is, you may not have treated them well enough in the past for them to give you permission or access to their thoughts, feelings, and inner world right now. And a lot of people who complain about the state of the world and the poor decisions of other people are seeing the world through that lens because they treat people badly when those people open up to and are vulnerable with them. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand that they're not being sensitive enough to other people's needs and wants and feelings when those things are shared with them for them to continue to have that permission and have that privilege of having access to those things. Absolutely. And that's why even though, you know, people could call their friends and family for free to vent and talk about their medical problems, they're coming to us. They're saying, we'd rather pay you to listen to us mm -hmm. than talk to our friends and family for free. Absolutely. And it's not that their friends and family don't care. It's not that their friends and family aren't well-intentioned. It's that their friends and family don't get some of these principles of how to relate to people, how to talk to people, how to listen. I mean, the whole premise of the book, quiet leadership, implies that for most of the interaction, you're not talking. You're mm -hmm. listening. You're quiet. Mm -hmm. You're letting them do all of the thinking. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. And that has blown me away in my, my practice where the best results I get are because I shut my mouth and listen rather mm -hmm. than just continuing to prattle on like I am now. Yeah, no, but it, it, that's the, that's the concept. You know, I think we're so prone to just quick to give advice. We like to give advice, you know, it yes. makes us feel empowered. It's like, you know, not just us practitioners, but just us in general, anybody. We like to give our friends advice. We like mm -hmm. to tell them, oh, this and that. But I think one of the things that he emphasizes and you talked about earlier is just you know, the concept of not giving advice and really listening. He quite and, literally says that on page yes. 125. Uh -huh. It's he like one of the beginning things. Leader, don't he give a, advice. Yeah, he says a quiet leader gives less advice than almost anyone else on the planet. Yes, yes. And I think if you've been, you know, in a health journey for any amount of time, you know that everyone is so quick to give you advice. And that's why you don't love going to your friends and family. Exactly. I remember... I remember feeling like that, feeling like I didn't want to share the details with anybody for a while because it just felt like every person couldn't say the right thing or said something hurtful and they didn't even know. And so there's grace for that. But 
Um, going to qualified people that do understand this is really important to get you to where you want to be. I could not agree more. <laughs> and that brings us to the second piece of this dance of insight, which is questioning. So the mm -hmm. minute you get permission with somebody to have a conversation, Hey, you know, Betty told me you were having headaches and I just wanted to ask you, you know, are you open to some, some potential solutions for your headaches? Mm -hmm. That's a much better opener than just, Hey, Betty told me you have headaches. And I have this great product. You've got to try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. that second opener just makes me feel uncomfortable just saying it. So getting permissions, that first par part and placement of, Hey, I heard you have headaches. That's uh -huh. where we are right now. We're talking about your headache. You want to talk about yep. your headache with me? Oh, you don't want to talk about your headaches with me? Totally fine. I get it. Maybe you're having one right now and you just can't stand to hear even the softest voice in the universe. Mm -hmm. The second step, once you've got permission, is asking questions. Tell yes. me about your headaches. How long have they been going on? When do they start? How long do they last? What else do you see with them? Who have you seen mm -hmm. for this? I mean, just asking all of these questions and understanding where they are in the journey of the problem, whether it's headaches or business problems or marital problems or whatever, where are you in the journey? And getting into how do you feel about it? How, how is your experience? I mean, and I'll often cover this with patients, you know, are, are, you know, you say you've got knee pain. Is this knee pain like you want to jump out of your skin and, you know, um, tear your hair out and you'll do literally mm -hmm. anything you would gargle bleach and chew glass in order to make it go away. Or is this like you take an Advil or an Aleve and it's gone for the rest of the day and you go to sleep mm -hmm. at night without any issues. Very big differences there yes. because people's problems externally may look the same, mm -hmm. but internally how they feel about them may be radically different. And understanding those feelings is actually critical to helping them understand how to change how they're thinking about the problem so that they can solve it mm -hmm. because how they're feeling about it, how they're thinking about it really has everything to do with where they take that or where they, how they seek to solve the problem when they do try to solve it. Mm -hmm. So questioning. And then the third thing is clarifying. And I, I started to do this unconsciously with patients uh, without even realizing the power of it. I, I would say things like, so, so, you know, we've talked about your headaches for 45 minutes gone through all your lab work, all your prior doctor's visits, everything we've gone through all of it. And here's where you are. And this is the clarifying piece. Your headaches are eight out of 10. They're six out of seven days a week. You can't do anything to get them better. At best, what you're currently doing gets them to go from eight to seven or six or five on a really good day. And you've tried supplements, diet and lifestyle changes, cryotherapy, red light therapy, um, every kind of pharmaceutical drug that's ever been approved or even used off label mm -hmm. for headaches and you haven't gotten results. Is that where we are right now? You're again, you're it's placement and it's clarifying where you are and where they are mm -hmm. in the process. And it's really critical to do that because if you have an idea in your head about where you are and it doesn't match up with what, where they are, or there's something important that you missed, when you're clarifying is when they'll come back and give you that information. And that actually can make a huge difference on then what you say next, mm -hmm. because if you run off after some solution and you haven't clarified well enough, gotten clarity on where they are and where they've been, you're just going to look like an idiot mm -hmm. and it's okay. It's going to happen to all of us, but the more clear you are and where they are and the more in alignment you are with them in terms of where you feel you are, as a team, so to speak, with the problem, mm -hmm. the better the results you're going to ultimately get. And then Absolutely. as you start to clarify with them, you go through a process of, well, you know, why do you think, or what do you think could be contributing to this? And you can go through, and in my world, what we do is we share information with them about all the different things that may be contributing to their problem. And then we help them achieve clarity on, oh, I see now, I mm -hmm. see now that doing this or that, or the other thing is creating the problem. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask them questions like, do you see why that could be an issue? Yes, mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. Do you see how this new way of doing things could be the solution you've been looking for? Uh, yes, I do. I get it now. 
And this failure to do this dance of insight is why so many patients come away disillusioned from practitioners. So many practitioners come away from the practice of medicine disillusioned with patients mm -hmm. because they're trying to get them to engage in behavior change. And they're just constantly saying things in the doctor's lounge like, well, I just don't know why they don't do this or why they won't listen to me or why this or why that. And then they'll usually end up compromising the quality of their care because they haven't been able to elevate the level of their interaction. Yes. And that's a big part of why I wanted to cover this book, because I think it's critical for doctors and patients and anyone who wants to help anybody to really engage with this process. And I can't, I truly can't do it justice in one podcast, but this book is great. Quiet Leadership, David Rock, read it. It'll change your life. If it doesn't, read it again. And, and, it will. It really will. I know, right? Yeah, it will. I think if you you read it and you take the principles and you actually apply them, I think that's kind of the thing about all these books. You know, we're reading books, we're summarizing books for you. But I think the next step now is to also take action on the books. Because if you read a book, it's not really any good if you don't do anything about it. It's great knowledge. That's awesome. <laughs> but right. I think the next step then now is saying, okay, what are some things that I can take away from this? and apply to my life right now. It might be a small step. It might be maybe you're 10 steps in and you already know half of this stuff. Awesome. What is the next step that you can take to actually apply this to your life and then get to the place you want to be? Absolutely. And on that note, join our programs and membership at stillmanwellness.com. Uh, we have an optimal wellness membership where you get access to all kinds of cool protocols. I just sent Amy mm -hmm. and Jim a bunch of new resources that we're going to be working up and getting into shape for uh, our members over there and make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast stillmanmd.substack.com that is where the podcast is hosted and published and if you'd like to become a patient at my medical practice go to stillmanmd.com and hit the consultation tab there's lots of different buttons on the website to help you get there it should be very obvious Anything you want to add to this, Amy? No, I think that was a good summary. I think the biggest thing that I always take away is, um, you know, just get a coach, you know, find someone that's actually going to help you walk this out. I think right. that it's, um, I think whenever I read a book like this, I just try to think back on to a time when I didn't live this out and think about like, okay, what would be the, the step that I would need, <laughs> you know, whether I'm sick or I'm just yeah. trying to learn this stuff as a practitioner. And I think the biggest thing for me that's helped over the course of time was getting my own coach who could coach me and tell me the things that I'm missing, not tell me, but coach me through the things I'm missing, ask yeah. me the questions. And then, then we get to a place of resolution and then I'm actually living it out. And I think that's been really powerful in my life. And I think that it'll be the same for everyone else who applies it. I totally agree. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Well, Take care. We'll see Have you a next great day. Week. We'll see you next week when we are, what are we doing next week? Um, I will send it out. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> great. Excellent. <laughs> Sounds Take good. Take care everyone. See you all. Bye.